the Aaron Lemor. Hashem seeks the motion Aaron, saying, Zos Chukas HaTorah. Uh, we had mentioned many times there are three classifications of laws in the Torah. There are Mishpatim. Mishpatim means laws which are rational laws, laws of possession, such as ownership, and therefore you're not permitted to steal, to damage. That's Mishpatim. Then there's Eidos. There's laws which are testaments. Eating matzah on Pesach, sitting in the sukkah, Shabbos. These are testaments that God's the creator, that God took us out of Egypt. In the desert, we were protected by the clouds of glory. And then we have chukim. Chukim are statutes. These are laws that on a rational level, you cannot relate to their innate value. Dietary laws, kashrus, sharpness, And, but the ultimate law, which we'll discuss in the moment, is what we're discussing here, is the paraduma, the red heifer. That, but what is the statute? That the red heifer, if a person comes in contact with the dead and is contaminated, any other level of contamination, a person is able to relieve that contaminated status by going to a mikvah, immersing himself in, in a stagnant body of water which meets the criteria of mikvah or a living wellspring, such a river and ocean which has natural underground springs. And if you immerse yourself properly, at the right time you're relieved. The contamination of dead, once you contract it, you can never be released of it unless you undergo the paraduma process, the red heifer which is discussed in this week's Parsha. So the, but the difficulty is, firstly, why? Secondly, the one who, although this mixture of the ash of the red heifer, if you meet all the criteria of how to prepare it, it purifies the one who has the contamination, but it contaminates the one who was involved in the process. So the question is, here you have the most intense level of impurity, and when it comes upon that person, he's relieved of that impurity which cannot be released only through this process and the one who's involved in the process he becomes contaminated it's referred to it's metairis at it purifies those who are contaminated and it contaminates those who are pure so the question is innately if it has that ability to purify as it does to the one who is contaminated with the dead why does it contaminate the one who's involved in the process and if it, it contaminates, how does it relieve a person of this most intense level of contamination? And we will see in a moment that Shlomo Melech, who understood every statute, dietary laws, wool and linen, wearing that, that you're not permitted, such things, he said, I understand everything, but this one, this statute, his words are, Rechokim imenu, It's something that's beyond my grasp. It's beyond my comprehension. There's something innate in this statute that even Shlomo Melech, with his unlimited level of wisdom, Chochem Ikolotim, was not able to even come upon to, to approach it, to have any entry point to try to understand, be able to understand it. And that's what Torah is speaking about over here. Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the ultimate statute. If you want to know what a statute is, this is the ultimate statute of the Torah. Ashitziv Hashem Leimor which Hashem has commanded, saying, Dabra b'nei Yisrael, v'yikho eilecho por aduma, t'mimo. You should take a red cow, red heifer, which is completely red, t'mimo, perfectly red. As we'll see, even if it has two black hairs, it's enough that it's, that actually is a indication it's not totally red. Asher eimbo mum, as a korban, it has no blemish, and there was no nothing ever put on it, meaning no yoke. But was, the Gemara tells us, even if the one who owned it, if he put his walking stick on it, or his garment on it, 
that's called the animal is being used as what? As a beast of burden. Anything that's put on the animal disqualifies it. It cannot be used for the process of the red heifer, for the paraduma. Let's see Rashi. What is Zos Chukas HaTorah? Fisha Sotan Vumas Olam. Mon Nes Yisroel. Sotan. And Umas Olam. And the nation of the world, Mod means they aggrieve the Jewish people. Meaning, they, the, the whisperings in our ears. Loma Ma Mitzvah Zos. What is this mitzvah all about? Ma Tam Yeshba. What is it? And what is its rationale? So the answer is, it's my decree. And you're not permitted even to try to approach it, to contemplate its understanding. I'm telling you up front, it's beyond your grasp, beyond your comprehension. It's something that's unfathomable. I always say, when we speak about speculation, you speculate. You have something which is an unknown quantity. You have no idea, there's no way, you have no, not a, no inclination to even know what it's about and you start speculating. Is that speculation? And whatever it is, it's you have never exposed to anything of its nature. There's no basis for speculation. Whatever you're going to come up with, it's definitely not the right thing because in terms of your frame of reference and your experiences in life, this has no relevance to anything that you, that you ever were exposed to. If that's the case, there's not even the basis seems to be, begin considering what it is, because whatever you're going to come, you're going to say, it's definitely not correct. It's my decree, and because it's my decree, you're not permitted even to question or to reflect on it, to try to figure it out. The Mishnah tells us in that if a person wants to know what existed pre-existence, before God created the world, what was the state of affairs in existence? This pre-existence. You're not permitted to even go there. Why not? If existence is ex nihilo, pre that, what is there? The only thing that existed is God. So if the only thing that existed is God, but God is infinite, whatever you're gonna say, you have no relevance even to come upon that because a finite being cannot in any way even approach something which is infinite because you're finite. It's not possible. As a result of that, it's also, you're not permitted even to try to come up to try to figure out what existed pre-existence. Xeri Milifonai, the red heifer, which we'll discuss in a moment, why is it every other statute, Shlomel says he's able to come upon it, to understand its rationale. But this is something, Shem says, Zosuk Zatoro. You're not permitted even to try to reflect to figure it out, which we can discuss. But it, it starts, the Sot, why does God have to say this, make the statement? Because Satan and Umas Olam, Satan and Umas Olam, they grieve us for this. They're whisperings in our ears. You know, it doesn't make any sense. What's it all about? Now it's interesting, there's a Midrash el elsewhere who also speaks about Chukim, such as Shatnis. A Jew is not permitted to wear a combination, a garment, wool, and linen. But yet, if you have a garment, which is a four corn garment made of linen, you have an abolition of old tzitzis in its corners. Although you're creating a combination by tying those strings into the corners of the garment, you create a combination of wool and linen. From there, the Torah, we learn, we draw from that, that that under normal circumstances, you're not permitted to wear the combination. However, if there's a conflict between a negative and positive commandment, and the only way you're able to fulfill the, the commandment is by being in violation of this combination, the positive commandment supersedes the negative commandment. Because if you have a four-cornered linen gar garment, and you must put wool tzitzis because tchelis can only be put on wool tzitzis. Therefore, the only way to deal with it, to reconcile it, is you have to say one has to override the other. That's where we learn the law of asay dochalos asay. Positive commandment supersedes negative commandment. So that's one of the cases, one of the 
that the Satan and the Umas Olam, they grieve us. Another one. We, we learned in the portion of Tazria that a woman who gives birth to a male, she's contaminated for the first seven days after giving birth. She goes to the mikveh. For the next 33 days, although she's menstruating, she's permitted to her husband for 33 days. If it goes beyond those 33 days, meaning you're already entering into the 40, 41st day, that blood contaminates her like menstrual blood. The husband's not permitted her. If it's a female, she's contaminated for 14 days. For the next 66 days, although she's menstruating, she's permitted to her husband. On the 81st night, then it takes, she takes on the status of a menstruant. She's not permitted to her husband. That's the law. And the Gemara tells us that in terms of the menstrual blood, which contaminates a woman normally during the period of menstruation, it's coming from the same source. And yet, during this period of time, it's permitted, and under normal circumstances, it's not permitted. That's another one of the cases that the Satan and Umas Olam, nations of the world, they grieve us. They say, it doesn't make sense. That's the point. It doesn't make sense. And he gives a number of examples. The Paraduma. It's Metair Es Atmeim. It relieves the person who's contaminated with the dead of his state of contamination. But yet the one who's involved in the process, he becomes contaminated. Again, it's something which is contradictory. What's the question? Because if innately it has the ability to purify what does it contaminate? If shatnis is innately, spiritually speaking, is lethal, lethal to your spiritual makeup, why now, if you created the combination, although it has stitches, why is it not lethal? And if menstrual blood is something which is lethal to a person's spiritual makeup, why during this period of time, although it's the exact same blood, why does it not affect the person? Why is it permitted? So all the examples given in terms of where the Satan and the nation will grieve us, it's all because this, not, not because they don't understand. Not understanding, that's not a, a criticism. That doesn't put us in a bad light. But something where, logically speaking, we find there's a, like a fallacy, it doesn't make any sense. Either it is or it's not. And since we can't reconcile the two, if that's the case, don't think it's something which is, which is absurd. That's where they attack us. Dietary laws is not a problem. Dietary laws. Because dietary laws are what? We don't know. God never revealed to us the, the rationale of dietary laws. But here, he doesn't have to. But just the, the function and the application, it seems to be contradictory. So here also, so therefore when we speak about the Umas Olam, the nations of the world and Satan, when they whisper in their ears and they say, you know, you don't look good. Here we're supposed to be the logical, intelligent people and we can't even defend it. To say God gave, said it's God given, okay, we don't understand. You're not an astrophysicist, you don't understand. But here it's something, it's not you don't understand, there's an inner contradiction in terms of the makeup of the law, in terms of its parameters. Either it is or it's not. Therefore, that this is why, but the ultimate is, Paraduma, which even Shlomo said, and why? Zosa Torah. It's my decree, and you're not permitted even to try to reflect on it, to try to understand it, because it's beyond your comprehension. That's the answer. You're never going to figure it out. You think you're going to figure it out? If Shlomo Melech, the wise man who ever lived, was not able to even approach it, had no entry point, don't waste your time. So it's not something, so if it confounded Shlomo Melech, the wisest man, and he didn't see it as foolishness, Evidently, it's something beyond our capacity. Okay? That's the understanding here. Nero Chofetz Chaim writes in one of his writings that in the 1800s, you know, the um, Ivory Coast, Jews from Lithuania and certain parts of Russia, they traveled to South Africa. In the, in the late 1800s. 
literally in South Africa, the level of opportunity, there was no opportunity in the world like South Africa. And many of the Jews went there. And whether it was diamonds, whether it was ostrich feathers, it's literally you could shovel gold in the streets there. And many Jews went there, observant Jews, and Judaism-wise, they did not survive it. They weren't observant to a degree. They were there for a short period of time. They already violated dietary laws and many other laws. Some of them, they left their families in Europe and they remained and even married non-Jewish women for the sake of the opportunity. And they abandoned totally their Judaism. And he writes over there, you, you arrive and you're dealing with the Boers and they see the Jews are pretty smart and they could, they, they could do profitable deals with them. But you go to, you're invited to the non-Jew's house and he offers you his cuisine. Not kosher meat, not kosher wine, all this. And Jew figures, if he doesn't drink and eat and dine with the non-Jew, he takes it personally, he's offended. As a result, of, and, he, and you look like some kind of primitive person besides being offensive. So what does the Jew do? For this short period of time, I'll be here. I'll compromise my religion. I'll make the fortune, bring it back to Europe, and I'll be back the committed Jew. But that's what happened. First, it's not justifiable in any circumstance. And very often, once it, as they say, it's a slippery slope. Many of the Jews, as a result of what they did there, they, many of them never came back and they forfeited their Judaism. So the Chavot Chaim points out over there, the committed Jew who goes and he, despite the non-Jews not understanding and being offended, ultimately the non-Jew will appreciate the Jew who observes his religion because if a Jew doesn't turn his back on God, he definitely will not go back on his word. He's a, that means he's a man who can be trusted. Meaning you, he cannot be bought for money. Meaning he has a state of commitment, he's committed, he has a level of integrity. He doesn't compromise his integrity. But if a Jew himself, he goes and he defies his God for the sake of the holy buck. So if he's dealing with the Jew who he sees doesn't respect his God for the prophet, how could he trust the Jew between the two of them? But a Jew who's willing to give up every opportunity for the sake of his religion, that's the Jew I could trust. So he says, initially they may be offended, but ultimately you're going to be the one who keeps, who observes your religion that the non-Jew is going to trust because he sees that you have standards and you will not violate those standards due to for the sake of financial profit.